Okay, I'd like to start with our land acknowledgement. Um, the archaeological research facility is located in Huichin, the ancestral and unceded territory of Chichenyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and made attempts to erase living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It's therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance and practice in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all Native and Indigenous peoples. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Charlotte Rose, who's going to be speaking on change and continuity, ancient Egyptian birth practices from the Middle Kingdom through the New Kingdom. So Dr. Charlotte Beryl Rose is an independent researcher living in Concord, California, who specializes in the material culture of Middle Kingdom and New Kingdom Egypt. She obtained her BA in Egyptology at Brown University and her master's degree and PhD and PhD in Egyptian archeology span at University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Rose has regularly presented her research at major conferences such as the American Research Center in Egypt, American Schools of Overseas Research, and the Society for the Study of Egyptian Antiquities. She has several years of museum experience as a researcher, public lecturer, tour guide, and docent, most recently volunteering with the British Museum for their Circulating Artifacts Project, CircArt, to track the circulation of objects in the antiquities trade to counteract looting. Her research interests include private religion, foreign relations, social class, and gender. Dr. Rosa's upcoming book on her dissertation research will be with Brill Publishers and their Harvard Egyptological Studies series. So with that, I welcome Dr. Rose. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming, and I'm honored to be speaking to you today. Uh, previous scholarship on various uh, texts and objects pertaining to uh, Egyptian fertility and birth practices have generally been either general studies or uh, 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 object specific uh, works. I, however, take a diachronic approach uh, from the Middle Kingdom to the New Kingdom, examining what changed or continued over time and why. Let's see, is there a way to switch this? Sorry, technical difficulties. Let's see, do I, how do I switch it? <laughs> Sorry, technical difficulties, everyone. Just clicking. Aha, there we go. All right, Get out of the way. Uh, here are the general dates to keep in mind and some important terminology. I distinguish between uh, materials that are for fertility, that is, uh, ability to produce offspring from uh, conception to birth uh, versus those materials that are specific to childbirth itself. Uh, another important term is uh, uh, solar birth, which refers to the Egyptian uh, mythical rebirth of the sun god each morning. Uh, in addition, there's the term apotropea, which means that materials that were supposed to ward off uh, uh, evil forces. There were four main uh, ancient Egyptian birth gods. The first is the Leonine uh, uh, god Aha, uh, who's later known uh, by his uh, New Kingdom name of Bess. Uh, likewise, a composite hippopotamus uh, pregnant goddess with a crocodile on the back uh, is named Ipe and Rera in the Middle Kingdom, and uh, she's better known to us by her. Uh, uh, New Kingdom name of Taweret. There's also the frog goddess uh, Heka as well as Hathor. Hathor is a major goddess with many different roles, particularly funerary. So for her uh, examination of the context where her objects occur uh, uh, is important to, to be able to distinguish which of the roles are in question. And uh, here's a map of some of the main sites. An important uh, thing to keep in mind for those who are not uh, Egyptologists is that uh, uh, Egyptologists generally refer to uh, uh, directions based on the orientation of the Nile. Since the Nile flows south to north, uh, when people say uh, Upper Egypt, it really means uh, uh, the south, whereas uh, Lower Egypt is 
uh, basically Memphis and the uh, Delta region. Likewise, uh, Middle Egypt is a region uh, right under the Fayum uh, down to Abydos, while the Fayum is the area of Lahun uh, and Lisht. I examined a plethora of different sources uh, from uh, texts, material culture, and uh, iconography. The latter includes uh, Ostaka from Dio Medina that depicted a birth arbor or Wolkamaba in German. My work examined objects with context, so my material, my iconographic and textual analyses were in relation to the material culture. During the Middle Kingdom, there was a division between the atropaic uh, solar birth iconography and the female and haphoric uh, centered imagery. There are a few objects that overlap, namely objects showing birth deities, particularly Aha Bess and Ibet Taweret, as well as birth bricks. Uh, with the uh, solar birth iconography, uh, it works by equating the uh, newborn child with the uh, sun god who is reborn each day. Uh, many of the atrotropic images include uh, some of our main deities of uh, uh, first deities of uh, Ahabes, Ipet Tawera, and Hecate, as well as a number of other figures that we uh, later know uh, are in funerary uh, papyri, such as the one. Uh, uh, in this slide. Uh, the apotropaea come in many different objects. The, the ones that are most typical are the birth ones. These ones, which are typically in ivory, mainly come from tombs and they belong to uh, elite female owners who bear titles such as mistress of the house, hereditary princess, and king's daughter. Indeed, one interesting example from Abydos has the titles of a late 13th dynasty king named Zeneb K. We know that uh, these wands are for childbirth because there is actual uh, written formulae on them, uh, explicitly saying they are the for the protection of the children of the female owner. In a shortened form of the formula, uh, it has a line of Saharu uh, uh, and Sagara, I don't know if it's able, yeah. Uh, which means protection of the day and protection of the night. It's pretty interesting because uh, we see uh, four medical magical uh, spells that have uh, that exact type of uh, formula. And it was explicitly for the protection of both male and female children. In addition to the textual record on these ones, we also have uh, uh, patterns of use wear, particularly on the uh, uh, curved end, uh, as well as uh, reworking and repairs. In this interesting case from uh, the uh, Budapest Museum of Fine Arts, we even have the ancient uh, tongs being able to uh, uh, hold the, the wand together. These were likely dragged on the ground, presumably to uh, form a protective circle around the pregnant uh, woman, which would be a similar type of uh, protection that the cartouche was supposed to offer to the royal name. In addition, we have uh, uh, Middle Kingdom and Second Intermediate Period tomb scenes that show uh, uh, female wet nurses uh, wielding these objects. Another object type of this uh, iconography are the baby feeding cups. They are small spouted cups or vessels that are mostly in clay found in domestic areas and tombs, particularly the tombs of young children. And several examples in limestone and one in, whoops, in uh, Fiance uh, have uh, the atropaic imagery. A study I did comparing uh, the diameters of these cups to uh, modern sippy cups, for instance, uh, indicated that the diameters were similar with uh, children as young as four months old being able to drink from them, which is consistent with the archeological evidence. Another type are certain types of animal figurines. Uh, 
These are mostly in faience and generally come from tombs in Egypt or were temple votives in temples outside of Egypt. Uh, the most relevant uh, figures are the standing lion, uh, the baboon that's supposed to represent the uh, uh, thoth, uh, the crocodile god Sobek, and felines. Uh, particularly interesting is that the standing lion during this period ha had a lot of uh, overlap with Epet to wear it, with uh, heel impressions of the deity occurring quite a bit in the uh, uh, Fayum town of Lahoon. Uh, a number of the uh, uh, lion figurines in, uh, occurred in Upper Egypt, while baboons were more common in the Memphite uh, Fayum area. And felines seem to have an association with Hathor, so most of them were actually found at the Hathor Temple in Sarabat el Khadam in the Sinai. Uh, crocodiles are particularly interesting because they were actually mostly in clay and uh, uh, located especially in uh, Lahoon. Uh, it seems to indicate that uh, Sobek during this period had some uh, uh, minor uh, fertility uh, roles as well. And one uh, uh, example that I show here in Egyptian blue was actually found in the same child's burial as the fayance cup I showed above. A number of the atropopeia had association with the, uh, the bedroom. It's an important point for what we see later on in the New Kingdom. For the wands, there are two tomb scenes depicting them uh, amongst bedroom objects like beds, uh, uh, the headrests, as well as uh, coal jars. In addition, there are a number of other atropaic objects that had uh, associations with the bedroom, ranging from uh, cosmetic or toiletry boxes, uh, certain types of uh, early to mid 18th dynasty coal vessels and some headrests. Interestingly, in uh, Kerma, down in Nubia, there was a, a Nubian uh, equivalent to this iconography. From uh, the second intermediate period tombs of Kerma, uh, there were wooden beds with uh, bed and glaze with a lot of similar figures, including our uh, Epet Tawera in particular. Another interesting object for our purposes is the 13th dynasty headrest of Neferhotep from his tomb in Thebes, uh, showing our uh, Ahabbes, Epet Tuweret, a standing lion, as well as uh, a uh, bull man. And the inscriptions is particularly interesting because we again see this uh, Saharu Sagara protection of the day, protection of the night that we've seen with the wands and some medical magical stuff. Uh, spells. To transition to the uh, Hathoric female imagery, there were three types of nude female figurines during time, this period. Uh, the Hathoric performers, a stylized handmade figurine, and black figurines. Uh, the Hathoric figures uh, can, uh, range from uh, paddle dolls that date from the uh, late 11th to early 12th dynasty generally, and the truncated figurines that date from the early 12th dynasty through the second intermediate period. These are uh, were generally located in areas of the royal cult and tombs. Uh, so for the petal dolls, it was mainly Dar al-Bahari, while with the move of the capital in the 12th dynasty to Egypt Tawi in the Fayum, uh, the truncated figurines were located mainly in Lisht, Asasif, and Lahim. Uh, according to Ellen Morris's work, uh, the uh, tat uh, tattooing, generally geometric, the brightly colored clothing, the general reveal, as well as archaeological associations with mirrors and musical instruments indicated that the paddle dolls in particular were associated with the Khenar uh, dancers. These are dancers that uh, uh, were associated with uh, royal funerary cults as well as uh, divine cults, particularly of Hathor. Uh, relatedly, the recent work by Angela Thule on the hairstyles of truncated figurines found that the braided styles had similarities with representations of uh, uh, female musicians and daughters of the uh, deceased 
uh, it serving a heroic role of uh, reviving the deceased. Uh, these heroic figures also had uh, uh, roles in childbirth itself. In the Sixth Dynasty tomb chapel of Watat Tethor, uh, uh, there is a scene of dancers uh, labeled Teneret uh, that explicitly state that they were there to uh, serve uh, childbirth. Likewise, in the Middle Kingdom birth legend of Papyrus Westcart, the goddesses that came to help the birth of uh, three kings uh, uh, came and disguised as dancers with knowledge of childbirth. In addition, some of the paddle dolls have uh, uh, images of our Epet to wear it. Another uh, uh, piece of evidence is that some of the truncated figurines are shown holding children. And in two interesting cases shown here, there's even uh, inscriptions uh, to the uh, a tomb owner from their relatives requ uh, specifically requesting a successful childbirth. In addition, there are handmade stylized figurines. They uh, generally occurred in uh, tombs in Upper Egypt for both uh, men, women, and children, and as well as a number were actually imported from Upper Egypt to uh, uh, the uh, Hathor temples located at the periphery of Egypt, such as Jebel Zayt uh, by the Red Sea. And some of these uh, also hold children, and they generally are subdivided into two types. Uh, so you have one that has pierced holes for the insertion of hair, and another with a uh, uh, fillet on top with uh, a number of different plates of hair that has some similarities with uh, some of the truncated uh, figurine hair hairstyles. Another important type are uh, plaque figurines. These are roughly shaped with more emphasis on certain feminine features, such as the, uh, the pubic triangle and breasts. These are almost always occur in towns. Uh, they are highly local in their decoration with uh, certain shapes being a front, uh, typical of certain areas or uh, red paint being common with those from uh, uh, lower Nubia uh, areas in Egyptian control. Um, Interestingly, some even show evidence of uh, pregnancy, such as if I can, I can't really do that right now. Well, I'll just minimize this. There we go, easy here, there. And in one really fascinating case, it's at the uh, uh, Carnegie Natural History Museum in Pittsburgh. Uh, it's from set the Abydos dating to the second intermediate period. Uh, there appears to be a circular protrusion coming out of the vulva area, it, uh, which may be a representation of childbirth, which is extremely rare in ancient Egyptian art. In, in addition, our uh, uh, figurines of male and female dwarfs, they stylistically have some similarities with the new female figurines in terms of having a, a larger bellies and some of the same jewelry and even some of the bra same uh, braided hairstyles on the uh, female dwarf figures. And the dwarves appear to have represented the survival of childbirth since it's it was rare in ancient times for a, a dwarf to survive to adulthood. And they seem to have some associations with Ahabes. Uh, interestingly, a number of the uh, female uh, uh, figures have uh, children. And these are generally located in tombs. On the other hand, there's a, a domestic variant in uh, Lahu that were in the shape of uh, jar stands. And these uh, indicate that there was some domestic cult at that time. In addition, our uh, uh, amulets are generally associated with the tombs of women. The most important ones are uh, cowries. Uh, which were associated with uh, uh, the goddess Hathor in her title, Lady of the Volva, as well as uh, acacia seed beads, which uh, 
uh, and we know from medical magical spells, acacia was used to, uh, to prevent bleeding and it, uh, the plant had associations with Tawaret. Um, there were uh, uh, some more, con and what's interesting is that there's some continuity in use over time with the non-elite uh, versions of the material. So for example, the regular cowrie, uh, cowries, the uh, cowrie shaped seals called uh, cowroids versus more elite materials such as the cowrie imitations in more precious materials. Uh, Aha best also occurred in uh, figurines and amulets during the Middle Kingdom. While most had a tomb context, some had a uh, domestic context, such as the uh, uh, mask here from uh, uh, Lahoon, which indicates that the god had both funerary and uh, uh, domestic roles during this time. He generally came in uh, three forms during this period. A male dwarfish form, a female uh, form, and uh, in the form of a child. Similarly, uh, Epet Tawera uh, occurred in both uh, funerary as well as domestic contexts. And there's an interesting variation of, uh, instead of just the crocodile uh, back, having a whole crocodile depicted on her back. And a number of seals with this goddess have uh, uh, domestic contexts. Uh, Heka it, during this period occurred in figurines and amulet seals. While most were in, uh, from tomb contexts, there's some evidence of repair of some of the amulet seals indicating they had prior use in daily life before final deposition. Hathor, uh, Interestingly enough, uh, there were very few uh, uh, privately owned materials uh, depicting her directly during this period. A less direct way of showing her occurred with the uh, one extant birth brick that we have, which was uh, excavated in South Abydos in the town of Wasut in the so-called mayor's house. Um, this, though we have uh, Textual evidence and iconographic evidence of the use of birth bricks from the 6th dynasty through the Greco Roman period. This is the only uh, excavated example so they found so far. A uh, number of the sites have uh, uh, the similar apotropaic figures, such as uh, Aha, Ipe, a standing lion, and a uh, cobra deity, sometimes with a human head that may be the goddess Renanutet. Um, now the main side, the most important side, uh, shows a successful uh, childbirth with the mother and child uh, flanked by midwives, and the whole scene in turn uh, flanked with tree trunks with uh, the Hathor emblem. Uh, Hathor has a title, Lady of Sycamore and Sycamore Trees, given their uh, locations at the desert margins that had uh, solar symbolism. Interestingly, uh, the hair of uh, Hathor, as well as all the women, were in this bluish color. And one of uh, 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 Hathor's tiles is referring to her uh, turquoise colored hair. So this seems to be a way of equating the mother um, um, indirectly with uh, the goddess. We know from uh, medical magical spells from uh, the Middle Kingdom through the New Kingdom that. Uh, the mother is often equated with Hathor or Isis to try to ensure successful childbirth, like uh, that of the goddesses. There are several uh, pieces of evidence that suggest that uh, four birth bricks were used, uh, uh, stacked in twos with the woman either uh, uh, squatting on top of them or uh, kneeling on them. Uh, from the 6th dynasty uh, uh, tomb chapel of Watak Kethor that I mentioned uh, previously, there's a birth song that the uh, dancers sing, including a line about the birth bricks, E E Fed O4, with the uh, uh, brick determinative. Similarly, in Papyrus Westcar, uh, the children were delivered on an E Fed M Jebet, a cushion of bricks uh, at the home. 
another piece of iconographic evidence is a uh, uh, some uh, uh, late Middle Kingdom rod segments. They're generally seatypes, uh, otherwise in other materials. They're generally located in tombs as well as the town of Lahoon. Um, they have some of the imagery of uh, uh, the uh, Atricopeia, including the figure, little figures on top. But, uh, and that, the sole complete example that we have from uh, uh, the Met shows four such segments. Interestingly, later on in, in the New Kingdom, with the Book of the Dead spell 151, they specified that there were supposed to be four funerary bricks located at the carnal points at the tomb. But in actual uh, New Kingdom royal tombs, uh, these bricks were found as pairs, indicating a, a, their use, uh, a use in uh, daily life for regular bricks. During the New Kingdom, iconography became standardized and focused on the main birth deities. Imagery of Hathor in private context became much more prevalent in uh, the cults of uh, Bess and, and Hawera were particularly prevalent in that domestic context. And, and a lot of material from Deir al Medina suggests there was even a uh, cult to uh, Hawera. And the Bess during this period became more standardized to a male dwar uh, dwarf figure, some of whom are holding instruments with the, uh, the female form being really rare during this time. Bess had also use in childbirth magic. Uh, we have purchase records from Dion Medina that record a purchase of a birth amulet and three New Kingdom medical magical spells discuss using a dwarf figures or a amulet of health. Given the uh, prevalence of Bess and New Kingdom iconography, uh, uh, it's uh, likely that the dwarf referred to uh, uh, images of Bess. One interesting spell that I've shown here from Papyrus Leiden I-348, uh, it, uh, it's repeated four times, uh, which may be another reference to birth bricks. The uh, New Kingdom birth iconography uh, focused on birth beds. These were typically decorated with uh, images of uh, Tawar and especially Bess. Uh, they uh, particularly occurred in domestic contexts like the Al Madina, as well as some in tombs. They both occur in relief panels as well as bed legs in the shape of Bess. The, uh, this iconography, iconography is also shown in uh, domestic wall paintings uh, from Dir al Medina and the town of Amarna, as well as in uh, tomb scenes and uh, beside the bed and under the as figures under the bed in New Kingdom. Uh, royal uh, birth scenes from uh, uh, mortuary temples of uh, Hatshepsut and Amenhotep III. The main features of this birthday iconography focus on the women and the toilet, the uh, divine beds, as well as vegetation. Uh, in the uh, domestic paintings and uh, the Wokalaba Ostraka, uh, a scene that's typical is uh, uh, the uh, uh, mother uh, frequently with the child, often nursing. Uh, she is served predominantly by female servants holding uh, objects such as uh, mirrors and coal jars. The coal jars may have had some fertility and bedroom protection given the abtropaic jars that I've shown earlier. And mirrors we know are associated with Hathor and her priestesses. In the female figurines, we also see this type of iconography. And actually, even in the Middle Kingdom, there were three examples of new female figurines found on bed models. And there's also nine exam such examples uh, from the New Kingdom. As some figurines uh, have items such as mirrors as well. So the uh, one figurine type from the New Kingdom that best matched this iconography are the woman on bed figurines. Either the woman is shown alone or with a child. 
And several of the figurines uh, even have uh, tattoos of vests on the thighs. Uh, and uh, in parallel to the female attendant seen on the uh, ostraca, uh, there's one uh, uh, woman on bed figurine from Garab where there's even a female nurse type figure. And uh, interestingly, several of the uh, uh, woman on bed figurines, particularly from uh, the town of Garab in Nil, Egypt, had a uh, uh, volvulous uh, vine decoration, and some even have depictions of snakes. Besides the woman on bed figurines, New Kingdom uh, 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 female figurines during this time predominantly occurred in domestic and upper Egypt, particularly the towns of Dira Medina and Amarna. Uh, some, like the Modius headdress and the uh, perfume comb types, even uh, uh, show children. Uh, plaque figurines during this period continued with some newer shapes, such as uh, full genital shapes, as well as painted uh, potsherds from uh, Dir al Medina. Um, and except into the generally uh, Domestic uh, figurines are the unadorned female uh, type and the handmade non-idealized ones with applied decoration, in that they both come from both domestic and temple contexts. Um, there's also a distinction between the uh, molded female figurines that generally had the slim body type uh, standard in ancient Egyptian art. Uh, versus a non-standardized appearance of uh, uh, the uh, handmade types that tend to, uh, to uh, focus on areas of uh, uh, fertility. Bess is often portrayed in the, these Vulcan Lava scenes as under the bed or, or as, uh, as the legs of the bed. Uh, and uh, interestingly, there's also a snake who is generally painted red, and that, that may be uh, the goddess Retinuta in her role as in ensuring breast milk. And we've actually seen imagery of this goddess before, back with the uh, apotropaic uh, stuff from the uh, Middle Kingdom. A uh, uh, Domestic wall painting from Amarna uh, even has uh, several dancing best figures before Taweret. Uh, likewise, in Dir al Medina, there were uh, six different wall paintings representing uh, best. Another theme was uh, vegetation, particularly decorating the birth arbor, uh, uh, with convolvulus vine being the most prevalent. Uh, this plant is often associated with women, such as in 19th to 21st dynasty sarcophagi lids of women, uh, tomb depictions show of a chantress of a moon, dancers, as well as the kiosk of a princess Mekatafin uh, in the uh, royal tomb in Amarna, and this princess may even died in childbirth. Uh, there's also a domestic wall painting uh, from the Medina showing a, a marsh scene, which is parallel to uh, votive faience bowls uh, that were dedicated to Hathor showing a female musician. Another thing, interesting thing to note, both in the, uh, the musician and the dancer fig uh, figure here, another wall, uh, domestic wall painting, is that you have the best tattoos on the thighs like we've seen with some of the woman on bed figurines. Bed metals on their own had their own uh, meaning. Uh, there are generally two types. Uh, one's a simple type and the other is molded. The regular type uh, generally had painted decoration on the top of either a lattice pattern or dots. One interesting example from Amarna located in the uh, Petri Museum had uh, image of Bess right next to the Cheter beetle, uh, which it, and a beetle uh, represents the word, the verb to become. So, and it's, interesting enough, there's a uh, some parallels with a uh, unprovenance uh, woman on bed to green held at the, the MFA, uh, where the headboard shows uh, Talwera and uh, dancing Bess, while the other side shows a woman holding a mirror and 
what perhaps is always unclear from the image may be a blue lotus flower that has some solar uh, uh, symbolism. More towards the late New Kingdom through the third intermediate period are beds with uh, molded uh, decoration and particularly showing uh, a scene uh, with a uh, best flanking either side and a uh, girl on a, a papyrus boat holding papyrus. This type of symbolism of uh, the papyrus may have, re uh, be, have referenced the, a ritual associated with Hathor, the seseshwaj or shaking of the papyrus uh, from uh, tomb scenes from the Old Kingdom on, as well as in some New Kingdom and late period temples. And these uh, tend to have a, a, a erotic theme to them. There are several implications uh, with the material in the study. One is the uh, degree of regionalization versus standardization, which reflected uh, levels of specialization and uh, local religious practices. With the figurines, you have uh, 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 a relatively few but uh, individualized elite historic performer uh, figurines versus the more widespread and domestic plaques and woman on bed uh, figurines that, uh, that tend to have stylizations that are uh, locally specific. Uh, Likewise, we have uh, the more standardized and uh, widespread types that tended to be uh, more uh, common in temples and have a more generalized appearance versus having uh, headdresses like the uh, perfume cone and a, the modius headdress. Uh, there's a possible reason for this difference. Uh, which may be that the more generalized appearance uh, of uh, these figures made them more appropriate for multiple stages in the fertility process. That would mean that a purchaser did not have to purchase so many to uh, donate to the temple. And that served uh, two purposes. One, it saves the donator money. And uh, the other, since the priesthood would have to clear out old votive to make room for new votives, uh, having less objects to deal with uh, would likely be quite helpful. In addition, uh, we also see uh, patterns of uh, uh, regional uh, religious practices and cults with the distribution of choroids and uh, the atropaic uh, figurines. Uh, for example, uh, plant decoration was more common in Memphis Bayoum, while uh, in Thebes, auspicious uh, hieroglyphs were more common on the cowrites. Another interesting thing to note is that there were less changes overall with the textual record versus the material uh, record, with the exception of uh, the uh, mentions of uh, best amulets uh, in the New Kingdom reflecting uh, the uh, use of best amulets prayer during that time. There's also no reference to apotropaea in the text, which is uh, particularly interesting. Some factors involved besides uh, gaps in our uh, textual record may be copying. Indeed, uh, the fertility uh, tests and spells from Papyrus uh, uh, Cahun uh, occurred almost verbatim in later New Kingdom copies. Another uh, uh, factor may be audience with the medical magical spells to, uh, to treat uh, a larger population. And indeed with the uh, Papyrus West card may have been aimed more for the lower elite as opposed to the high elite that would have used the wands. Uh, in contrast, the records from Dio Medina were more, uh, much more consistent with the, the material culture from that location, indicating they served the same population. Finally, uh, the degree of, uh, of shifts differed by social class with generally more gradual developments with uh, uh, non-elite imagery ultimately developing into a standardized birth iconography that was distinct from the uh, from solar birth iconography. In contrast with the elite, you'll have uh, uh, materials becoming uh, uh, less available over time uh, in the second intermediate period, and with uh, and with that, things like uh, the ones iconography not being as rarely available likely made 
the idea of using them for daily use to uh, not be as feasible, and hence why the atropopeic figures became a funerary post uh, the second Enemia period. And, and with this decline of the elite, you also have a, a decline in the enforcement of uh, uh, religious restrictions on the use of privately owned Hathor objects and uh, depictions of non-divine women along birthdays. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, listening to this talk and I look forward to your questions. Yes. Thank you. It's always amazing to see a it's, it's always amazing to see a completely different archaeological record. I've just been to the Ramses exhibit <laughs> in San Francisco, and there were certainly, I mean, there were some cowrie shell jewelry, but they're really otherwise not so much. So, and of course, this is the kind of information about uh, a major portion of the population and the continuation of the population. So I just wanted to thank you for that and also say, um, if I were giving birth, having that little best figure would scare any baby right out of me. <laughs> and having it tapped on your head like that, it's just like, oh goodness, like, let's get this over with. <laughs> anyway, so it's very interesting, the choice of, um, of imagery and their, those different uh, deities. So thank you again. Thank I don't you. have any particular questions, but thank you. Thanks. What's a birth brick? Uh, yeah. It's a, 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 a brick that uh, generally, uh, in, like in the case of uh, the one birth brick that we have, is uh, marked as for childbirth because it has uh, painted imagery on them. And back in the, uh, the uh, uh, early modern times, it was actually more common for uh, women to either be in a squatting position with uh, either foot support by a brick and generally you have one midwife holding them up and one uh, at the bottom waiting to catch the infant. It was basically a way of using uh, gravity to speed things along. Like similar to some latrines in China yeah, yeah. and Asia. Yeah. <laughs> It just seems like balancing on the two bricks would be. Doesn't, doesn't make it any easier. It doesn't. I, it's, it's, it's the point of the bricks to. <laughs> it's the point of the bricks to try to elevate them so that they have room to catch a baby. Possibly, there's also some that symbolism involved because uh, with uh, the child coming in and the two elevated points, it. Uh, Greeks uh, shaped like the hieroglyph or the horizon, the acha, and uh, uh, that's another way of symbolizing a, a connection of the newborn with the always successfully reborn sun god. I imagine people had to be holding the person. Yeah, that's why with the birth brick, you I have mean, the. Yeah, that's why you, you generally see trying to balance. Two, yeah, that's why you generally see two midwives, uh, one at the back and one at the front, precisely to provide that type of support. <laughs> oh, we uh, then evolve on to the birthing chair, which is a little more comfortable. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the antiquities trade um, project you're working on. Well, uh, it was tracking uh, materials that were on uh, antiquities dealers' websites to see uh, how often objects were uh, traded around, uh, for, uh, for instance, uh, and generally uh, seeing, okay, are there perhaps materials that, for example, may be evidence of uh, money laundering, particularly if they're changing hands like once every month or so. And um, uh, the person in charge of that project at the time was Dr. Susanna Bay, who's now at uh, University of Edinburgh. And uh, I believe that she has uh, published some more details about the final findings. So I was just curious to hear a little more a bit about the birth wands. I, um, one is 
question is that they look like they're, um, you said they're elite related and they look like they're made of maybe hippo tusks or something. Yeah. So like how, how big are they? And are there like non-elite versions not made out of ivory or a material that would be cheaper to find? And also, um, did they have any functional use? Like I see, you know, as it seems like a lot of these things related to the birth uh, practices are like pointy things. And I hate to say that, but like, you know, sometimes you break the amniotic fluid or whatever. I don't know if they, it could, is there any evidence that there's some use of them other than magical? Uh, there's not really any evidence that they were used for breaking the amniotic fluid. We have uh, uh, at least one uh, medical magical spell related to trying to uh, get the uh, hasten childbirth, and it doesn't really mention that. Um, so part of the issues is that we don't have the textual record to uh, back anything up uh, about that. Um, so it, uh, it it does seem to be more something that's bragged on the ground at least. Uh, so we have that evidence. Um, and these wands are generally about uh, uh, handheld size, so you hold the sharp the little bit sharper end. And uh, while a lot of them are in uh, uh, hippo ivory, uh, there are some that are in faience, and it's. It doesn't really seem that uh, material uh, uh, was as uh, big of a factor, uh, perhaps, because there's uh, the uh, one that I mentioned from a BIOS that had the in, uh, inscriptions of uh, SynMK was actually made of clay. Um, so I think it may be based on what materials were available or uh, um, how uh, uh, often the objects would be used or re uh, reused um, because we do have plenty of evidence of reworking of figures and uh, repairs even. So these were used for multiple births and had wear and tear on them. Object, nothing about this, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, it did <clears throat> remind me of, um, I, I guess, a plow, you know, the end of a plow. And I believe there were some uh, practices um, with a ceremonial um, platform being dragged across the field with those kinds of objects in it to scratch the earth, you know, kind of that early, very shallow plow. So creating that furrow. Um, and I can't remember where, you know, that reference from. But, but I'm just wondering if that, that's that continuity of a form that is used to open up the earth to bring forth life, you know, the agricultural connection. You know, with, with That's interesting. I haven't heard that as a suggestion about these uh, types of wands before, but it makes some sense, at least in terms of that we know that they were uh, dragged and used. Hmm. 